All right, I think we'll get started. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we, we get underway. Um, so hello, I'm Stephen Haven, uh, a digital and data consultant at the Energy Systems Catapult. Um, welcome to another Value and Energy Data seminar. So uh, just a few things to bear in mind. So we'll re be recording this, so it'll be on YouTube later. Um, please keep your microphone and your cameras off. Uh, so we can focus in on the, the speaker and their presentation. Um, and for questions, we'll leave them till the end. So re please type them in the in the chat as we go along, and then we'll uh, we'll do a few questions then. So yeah, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, David Sykes. Um, he's the lead data team lead at the Octopus Energy Group, uh, a group of companies driving energy system change through innovation, uh, innovative customer propositions and technology. Uh, the group serves over 3 million energy customers in seven countries and owns and operates £4 billion worth of renewable assets. Um, so David's built and now leads the global data function and is responsible for analytics, data engineering and data science across the group. So I'm very pleased to introduce him and his talk is going to be about using data to modernise energy retail. So take it away. Hello everybody. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for the intro. Um, let me share some slides. Uh, can you see uh, some tentacles and some wind turbines? Yep, I can see that. Great. Um, super. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm David. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I'm going to give you uh, a, probably a bit of a ramshackle tour through um, some of the stuff we're doing at Octopus Energy um, using data to uh, to modernise energy retail, and I'll, I'll probably describe a little bit about what that means um, as well. I'll also give you some um, some probably some uh, some uh, opinionated thoughts on on how we should be doing um, using data more effectively in the energy sector as well. Um, feel free to sort of uh, put your questions in the chat or fire them at me at the end. There'll be plenty of time for questions, I think. Um, so. Uh, just to start with, um, I wanted to give a quick intro to uh, Octopus and, and myself. Um, so uh, I've been Octopus. I've been at Octopus since uh, 2016, so right from the beginning. Um, and uh, back then we were we were a small group of people tr setting out to build a, um, a really sort of technology-driven energy uh, energy supplier. Um, we uh, from there grew probably a lot faster than we expected. Um, uh, got a lot of customers and did a, uh, what I think was a wonderful job of looking after our customers. We had an amazing customer service, which we pride ourselves on, won lots of awards. Um, and crucially, like I think um, many other disruptors in the tech space, I think for me, the commonality in um, in any disruptor in a, in a space is that, is that they build technology to enable a new operating model as opposed to sort of buying technology to um, to facilitate their operating model. And so we built Kraken, which is our, um, you know, you can see the tentacles at the beginning. Kraken is our um, our platform that runs a sort of full stack platform for running a modern energy retailer, uh, and um, uh, and so we built that, and and that's that's been um, very useful for us, and uh, it actually then became very useful for other people. So we now license Kraken uh, out to lots of other retailers. So in in Australia, Origin, who are um, I think the biggest uh, energy retailer out there. Uh, in the UK, Eon and and their NPower book, um, which the uh, we've I think we've got about six million customers on there. We'll be doing EDF next year. So we've gone from being a a supplier to a to a technology business. Um, uh, and uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, we've also now started to add other tentacles to our business to allow us to basically enable the energy transition in in different ways. Um, so. Uh, if you look at us, if you looked at our company structure, or if you looked at us from the outside, you might see uh, uh, quite a complex group of activities, um, a lot of diversity and variety in, in what we're doing. Um, but for me, it boils, our mission sort of boils down to this one um, thing, which is f fundamentally, um, we feel like that. So we, this this picture is actually quite helpful. So in the background of this picture, you can see wind turbines, um, and that's a good uh, illustration of the sort of first phase of the net zero transition that um, that that we've been through. So uh, the wind we've we've added we've done an amazing job, particularly in the UK, of adding a lot of low carbon generation into the system, and the system has done a great job of absorbing that low carbon generation in a way that customers don't really or haven't had to really engage with, other than perhaps slightly lower lower prices. Um, 
the next phase of the energy transition is harder because it requires us to change the way consumers use uh, energy. So change the way they heat, change the way they um, uh, where they get around. And so we believe the only way to do that is is in a customer led way. And you basically have to provide better products than what they have right now. So Tesla is an, a wonderful example of a company that said the way we win in EVs is we provide a better car than a than a, a nice car. And uh, and and that's how you get uptake. So we believe in um, great products backed by great technology to enable the net zero transition. Um, in a little bit more detail, I guess, uh, what that means, what we think about in terms of the, the energy transition is uh, really a change in the sort of fundamental dynamics of the energy system. So um, uh, electrification of the key domestic loads, so that's transport and heat, um, uh, a lot of renewable generation, which means that also, which is obviously intermittent. So we, we believe that we need to have a very, very smart demand that can flexibly flexibly follow supply and also flexibly adapt to the network constraints. Um, uh, we believe um, in uh, sort of decommoditizing energy in, in a sense in, in that it's going to be much more than just your energy bill in the way you interact with with energy services. Uh, it's like how you heat your home, how you get around, how you lease your car, uh, and fundamentally also that consumers need to drive this. So this will not happen unless consumers are heavily engaged. Um, and so we've started to now put together uh, a group of businesses that go actually well beyond just an energy supplier that we believe can deliver this energy transition, um, uh, and so it starts with with retail energy. We've got about 3.4 million customers in eight countries now, um, and we pride ourselves on on customer service. And we see that as the uh, as the starting point for for getting customers hooked on uh, on great decarbonizing octopus energy services. So provide them a really great experience with the basics, uh, and then take it from there. Um, we have a tech licensing business, so. Um, we sadly do not have the balance sheet to transition the whole world um, into low carbon consumer energy products. But what we can do is provide software that, that enables other great utilities and partners um, like people like E.ON to be able to do it themselves. So that's what Kraken Tech is all about. It's about enabling um, other companies to do, uh, do similar. Um, we brought under the Octopus Energy Group our uh, generation business. They manage um, I think four to five billion of, of assets in nine countries, obviously building generation and, and connecting finance to generation assets is crucial. Uh, and now we have this burgeoning group of energy services. So um, we have an electric vehicle leasing company. Um, we are building our own uh, heat pump technology, but also we're rolling out uh, heat pump installation services in uh, many countries. Um, and that's built off the back of our smart meter, our ability to install smart meters with sort of upskilling that workforce and taking that logistics model into the heat pump space. Um, we have a hydrogen business uh, for specifically for you know the, the, the key hydrogen use cases. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, and we're starting also to get into things like solar and batteries. So the idea is we can offer customers the full stack decarbonization package, um, all from all within the Octopus brand. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I run the data team. Um, I was the data team for a while uh, and have and built it up. Um, I see my role uh, mainly as a, as a herder of data scientists and engineers. So getting people in the right place with the right tools, working on the right projects is, is my job now. Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, telling uh, SaaS salespeople that I don't want their products and also um, telling recruiters that, uh, that we're full. Uh, and um, I, I'm extremely passionate about the, the energy system. I think the energy system is uh, an unbelievably uh, fascinating thing to work on in whatever, you know, wherever you sit within this energy system, it's an unbelievable mix of um, technology, customer dynamics and behavior, economics, it's politics, it's all over the news. Um, it, it is just such a, 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 and also crucially, it's such a, like our biggest challenge is the society. Um, and so I think it's a really, really exciting place to work. Um, uh, and I think crucially in my role right now, what I've come to realize very quickly is uh, I, I sit on top of a very, very talented team of people. So um, 
a lot of the stuff I show you today is stuff that my team have worked on and done, um, and uh, uh, they leveraged me a, a long way. Um, and outside of Octopus, um, I uh, I sit on the National Grid Technical Advisory Council, which um, gives me a good view of uh, how the ESO are adapting their technology for the challenges they have. Um, the Strategic Innovation Fund uh, competition assessor. So what that means is I I help um, assess new uh, funding bids for innovation projects. Um, I write blog posts about the correlation between energy and vegetables. Uh, I do a lot of cycling and like I think a lot of people in school, I tinker with a lot of home technology, particularly in the in the energy space. Um, I thought it might be useful to talk through a little bit about uh, how a data team evolves from a small startup to a to a global enterprise um, and what the challenges there have been. So um, I sort of see it in three phases, uh, loosely defined phases. Early days, um, that picture on the left is uh, my first first hire in the data team, a chap called Ali. Uh, back then, we were a two person team of data people. We did everything. Um, we were mainly firefighting, uh, answering as many questions as we physically could from the management team. And really our users for our data wasn't we didn't really have a data platform back then but we had um our, we had sort of data tools and, and our users were sort of five to ten managers within the business so enough people that you could gather in a room or and also have personal relations relationships with each one to be able to understand their needs um the second phase i guess is uh, as we started to grow we we grew our data team out um and as we grew our data team we needed better tooling and that tooling was uh, we needed better tooling in terms of managing workloads across, uh, you know, coordinating workloads across multiple contributors, but also because our data grew uh, and we couldn't just plug into the sort of back end production database anymore. Um, we needed to build data warehouses and data lakes um, and our user gr uh, group grew as well. So we, we grew to sort of 50 to 100 people who are using our data tools internally day to day. Uh, and where we are now is we have a global data community. So um, uh, I no longer sort of personally manage everyone who works on data within the business. That that would be impossible. Uh, we've got um, 30 plus sort of dedicated data professionals all over across all of those businesses that I described and across all of the different offices around the world. Um, we've built a uh, pretty robust data platform um, built uh, using uh, some close, some sort of commercial tools like Databricks and some open source tools, which are very handy, like DBT and the OpenML stack. Um, and we have over 300 users around the world who are using our, our tools. So, uh, you know, I can't, I don't know everybody who uses our data tools, nor can I speak to them all. So, um, so we've had to productionalize a lot of, uh, a lot of the way we provide data to the business. Um, before I talk about the some of the use cases that we're doing to to modernize the energy space. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the data maturity curve, which I think is a very important um, concept uh, within the data space. Um, and really what it describes is uh, the different stages, maturity stages of of, um, of your data tooling or your, or your, or your data use cases um, and, the, and the value you can get from them. And it starts really with capturing data digitally. So can you, do you, do you have the data you want to analyze? Are you even capturing it? And if you are capturing it, are you capturing it uh, on, on paper or are you actually capturing it in a digital format? Then cleansing and putting that data in a database. So that crucially makes it queryable and joinable to other data sources. Then you can build a bunch of reports and dashboards on top of that. So uh, those tend to be um, quite strictly defined pretty inflexible but maybe describe a few key KPIs that you want to do. Um, the, 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 the next phase is the ability to ask that data uh, ad hoc questions so any sort of freeform questions that you want that allows you to really explore the data and understand how that data relates to your your business or your use case that you're, that you're doing and off the back of that then you can start to build actionable insights or campaigns or products so yeah, that might be as simple as can you get me a mailing list of all customers of a specific type or or who are in this campaign or all customers who um, used a lot of electricity yesterday uh, when it was windy um, uh, or it might be um, a sophisticated product like um, can you show me can, can we have a, a UI that allows people to choose whether they've or, or just see whether they their property is um, viable for a heat pump 
Um, then on top of that, so up to that point in the in the journey, uh, you're really just um, organizing the data and asking it questions. Um, the next phase is then to is to build models on top of it. So use that data to uh, to inform, to predict, to classify, uh, um, and, and apply those models to to specific use cases in the business. Um, and then on from there is is the sort of nirvana for data teams, which is to take your data and be able to use it to automate uh, and optimize decision making within the business, either decision making internally or, or or help customers to make the right decisions or customers assets to make the right decisions. Um, and depending on your where uh, on on the on the um, use case, actually, I, I've specifically given this curve a straight line rather than rather than um, opinionatingly putting a curve on it because I think. It really depends what you're doing. Sometimes a lot of the, you know, the the the, the value gradient, the value to effort gradient is is higher up here, and often it's it's higher down here. Just getting your data in a usable format is often the highest value to effort um, you can do. But being able to assess this and understand it for any um, for anything you're doing in the data space is is crucial. Um, so what I'm going to talk through is a few examples of different. Uh, different ways we use data within, within Octopus. Um, so fundamentally, just running a retail business effectively, there's a lot of data work that goes into that. Internally optimizing our business, how can we make ourselves more efficient, make better decisions? And then how do we launch new products and services that uh, are going to inspire customers or help customers to decarbonize their lives? So on the, um, on the basis of energy retail, one of the fundamental things we have to do is, uh, is buy energy for customers. Um, and to do that, we need to be able to predict how much they're going to use. Uh, and equally, we have to predict how much our assets are going to produce. So this is a good example of um, a machine learning pipeline that we use to predict how much our wind assets are going to produce. Um, and what we do, it's uh, I think it will look very familiar to lots of people in this call. Um, we take historic weather data, we take historic site generation, we run some pretty simple regression analysis on it. Um, crucially, we add a step in here to allow for operational tuning. So that's kind of saying, I know this asset is going to be out next week, or I know this asset was um, running at half operation, um, operational capacity two weeks ago for this reason. And so uh, I can adjust my model on, based on that. That then gives you a sort of adjusted tune site model. And what we then do is we feed in um, 50 weather scenarios into that. So these are 50 equally likely weather scenarios provided by um, the ECMWF. Um, and what that allows us to do is rather than predict one deterministic uh, weather um, production forecast, it allows us to predict a distribution of production forecasts um, that we can then use to make trading decisions. Um, and I think what we've learned through the development of this, uh, it's three things. One is uh, keep it simple. So um, if you can use a simple model, use a simple model. There's no point chucking stuff into hyper complicated models for the sake of it. Um, keep it interpretable. So in the parameters that come out of the regression analysis are extraordinarily useful and tunable um, for this use case. Uh, and you wouldn't get that from a black box model. Um, and then make it flexible so we, we can, as I said, um, you can take this model and you can, you can adjust it for the operational constraints you see at the time um, and run different scenarios to run trading decisions. Uh, so the second use case I was going to describe is uh, business optimization, internal business optimization. So this is a project um, the team have been working on recently. Uh, and as you can imagine, particularly at the moment with what's going on in the energy markets, um, we have a lot of worried customers uh, who get in touch. We have, um, uh, you know, as a co company of three and a half million customers, we, get, we have a lot of inbound email messages. Um, and understanding the content of those email messages is, is, is very, very useful for us, not only to understand what's driving inbound volume, but also to be able to root stuff into smart uh, downstream processes. And so this is a machine learning pipeline we've been um, working on. Effectively, what we do is we take the text of the inbound messages uh, and then we ran a, those, those are not labeled right now. So um, we, we experimented with unsupervised learning techniques, but in the end, we decided the best way was just to uh, brute force label them. So we bought people a lot of pizza um, and we ran a labeling party. Uh, we built um, a labeling system for ourselves, um, which allowed you to spin up some messages and then put labels on them. Um, and that allowed us to build a, tra a, 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 a training set to be able to train the model on. 
we then ran uh, model of selection and training. So we, we were comparing two types of models. One is an AWS uh, out the box service, um, and one is um, a set of transformers from Hugging Face, which is an open source uh, NLP and machine learning framework. Um, and we uh, effectively just ran a competition between the two to, to understand um, which had the best uh, precision and recall against uh, different uh, labels. And then uh, we put that into production. So uh, the the, mo the best the model that we trained we run in production. Um, when a message comes in, it gets run through the model and it gets added a uh, a label to it. So you can see here is the label added to the um, to the message. But crucially, we've added within the UI the ability to uh, add different tags if you think it's not tagged properly, or remove or adjust tags. And that's really important because that allows us to retrain stuff on the fly and learn as we go, rather than having to go through the batch labeling process over and over again. So you can see we're constantly retraining the model as we go. Um, and again, some lessons learned for us here. Um, number one is use the models that are, that are out there. So uh, uh, Johnny, who's one of my team who works on this, said to me yesterday, I was sort of talking to him about it, and he said, uh, he put it perfectly, he said, be a practitioner and not a, not a researcher. We, we don't have the time or resource to be researchers. There are amazing organizations with far more compute power uh, and far more um, PhDs and postdocs working on this kind of thing. Uh, for us to be starting to invent natural language processing algorithms from scratch. There's also incredible frameworks uh, and commercial products out there. So um, we use those where we can rather than try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, and then crucially, the UI and UX is, is crucial. So um, you could have an amazing model, but if you stick it behind a rubbish UI or user experience, nobody's going to use it. So uh, a lot of the work goes into making sure we have great uh, user interfaces to run with. Uh, and then finally, new products and services. So um, we uh, we are constantly launching uh, new products and services that allow that try and help customers decarbonize. Um, and most of these are, are heavily data driven. So I'm going to talk through two of them right now. Um, one is Intelligent Octopus. So this is a product um, which allows customers to effectively have hands off hands off optimization of their electric vehicle charging. Um, uh, so we effectively take over control of electric the electric vehicle charging on behalf of the customer. They tell us their needs um, and as a result, they get a cheap um, a tariff. So we reward them. It's sort of sort of shared reward. Uh, in terms of what this looks like for the customer UI. Um, so step one, super simple. Customer logs into the app. Uh, they um, they put in their device details. They authenticate their device through the device APIs um, and, and then it's ready to go. They then tell us two very, very simple uh, constraints. How, what charge limit do you want and what time do you want your, your car ready by? Um, and then all they have to do is plug the car in uh, and we take it from there. And, and this, is, this is what we do. So um, this shows you here, uh, the, uh, this is sort of an, an, a night, so this crosses two days. So this is um, 4 p.m. and this is 8 a.m. the next morning. And um, and the gray bars are the price uh, of electricity through that period. And what if we if we didn't have any smart control, what would happen is that customers would get home from about 4 p.m. all the way through to uh, late in the evening and they'd plug their car in and their car would immediately start charging. So you'd basically get this ramping peak of charge, um, which sort of crosses the evening peak in terms of both price and uh, and network constraint. Um, the other thing we can do is we can give them a, pr a dumb price signal. So we can give them, we have Octopus Go, which is our dumb price signal product. And if we give them a dumb price signal, what they do is they will go and they will charge in that price signal, which is great, but you get a lump of load um, through the system, maybe not even at the cheapest time. And what we uh, what we can do with uh, Intelligent Octopus is we can use um, optimization algorithms and all the infrastructure that we've got uh, to deliver this product, we take the customer's requirements and we find the optimum charging profile um, that fits those requirements. And so this shows you the um, the load profile that our intelligent octopus customers would get through that period. And what you can see is it's picking out the very cheapest time periods to charge the charge the vehicle. Um, and uh, here's a here's a great example of how how high fidelity the optimization is. Um, hang on, I think someone might be unmuted. 
Thank you. Um, so you can see here that it's left a little bit of a little bit of juice for the last um, for the last low period. So uh, so it's picked up the last bit of charge in that period. Um, the great thing is we can then play all these assets into um, not just the wholesale market, which this is optimizing against, but any um, local flexibility markets, balancing markets, um, and, and services that the ESO needs. So the second product that we've launched, um, we actually launched it last year, and I think we'll be doing it again this year, is called the Winter Workout. So the idea here is that with energy prices high, uh, we wanted to provide customers with um, a way to save um, on their energy bills, particularly on their, on their, heat, their gas heating bills, um, uh, and do it in a way that you know is uh, is interactive and rewarding for them, as opposed to just someone telling them to um, put a draft excluder under their door. Um, and so what happened here was we um, got customers to sign up um, and we gave them um, a target uh, consumption based. And so for each customer, we were building a model of um, how much we expected them to consume on a daily basis, uh, including, you know, based on their previous consumption, but also baking in all of the um, weather forecast and actual weather. Um, so effectively for each customer, they had a target um, consumption and then we use their actual consumption either from their smart meter or from their dumb meter um, and what we could do then is allow customers to track their progress against their target so kind of like um, if you've ever played Mario Kart and you've got the sort of ghost uh, character you've got your ghost and you're trying to beat your ghost um, around the track it's, it was the same here um, and then we gave them a bunch of tips and the more they saved the more um, the more points they got in a in a um, in a prize draw um, but also the more they the more CO2 they saved and the more money they saved on their bills. And uh, this shows you some of the results. So um, we had 250,000 participants, two thirds of those managed to reduce their gas usage. Of those that reduced, um, they saved about 12% on their bills. That three million pounds saved 14 million um, kilograms of CO2. Um, and uh, this is going to be even more impactful this year with, with, with energy prices so high um, and is a really, really crucial and perhaps slightly overlooked um, lever that could be pulled by uh, by government um, in terms of trying to reduce the, the overall system demand through this winter. So that, that was um, a run through of, uh, of what we're doing at Octopus and um, uh, and just a, a small snippet into into some of the projects um, that we do. I, I was now going to uh, take this platform and opportunity to um, talk about um, what I think the energy sector can maybe pick up from um, what we've learned, but also some, some 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 general lessons from the wider data world about how to approach data. So um, apologies for this um, this short. Hopefully, it won't be a rant. Um, so, so I think the first thing that, that we've learned a lot over the years is um, I described the uh, energy um, maturity uh, curve earlier. Um, crucially, what I've learned is that uh, a lot of the value lives um, early on at the bottom of this curve. And in fact, it's very difficult to do the stuff at the top of the curve if you haven't done the stuff at the bottom of the curve really effectively. It's very difficult to build automated um, decision engines if you haven't got your data captured digitally. And so um uh i put an example maybe of, of some of the stuff i've seen in the in the energy sector that gets proposed as projects um uh, and where that fits in terms of the data uh in terms of this data maturity curve so for example i would say um networks understanding exactly how mpans are connected to their assets even down to the to the sort of household and which phase it's on um uh, and being able to digitally represent that and share that data digitally in, in a in an easy manner that would be I would classify that as um, low maturity but very very high value work um, that kind of project is the building block for, for some of the digital twin work that is getting proposed in the industry right now um, where we're effectively building coupled predictive models of what's going on um, in the in the in the networks and those can be used to um, inform both operational and planning actions and so both are uh, extraordinarily useful things um, but I don't think you can do the predictive twin without having the um, without having the, the sort of doing the grunt work on the data prep up front uh, second thing I talked about earlier is um, 
not trying to reinvent the wheel. So um, what we what uh, it, it's crucial not to not to um, where there's stuff available, where their models trained or an easy approach. Um, we always try and take the take that approach as opposed to building ourselves. And that's a resource constraint, but also um, the nature of open source uh, and community driven stuff means that as an organization, it's very rare that you can run faster than um, than communities. And I think we're seeing that right now in um, I don't know if people are following what's going on in um, this sort of generative image space with things like stable diffusion and um, and DALI. Those those are two models that have been picked up by the um, uh, by by the community and the use cases being done on the internet right now are absolutely mind blowing um, in terms of uh, what's being done. And all of that is through um, uh, it's through sort of community development on top of a core model. So um, crucially, as an as a sector, we are certainly um, definitely behind most other sectors in terms of our our data and our um, algorithmic uh, sort of maturity. And so. It's, there's no shame in us as, as a sector following other sectors in, in, in what they do and how they do it. Um, the third one, I think, I, I hope this is, for me, this is probably the most important, um, is that there is absolutely no point in doing uh, data-driven, um, lots of fancy data-driven stuff without a value, a value signal. Um, and so, um, what I mean by that before I talk about this example is um, for, let's imagine a world where everything gets put on the standing charge in terms of cost um, in, in the electricity sector. What that means is there's no there's, a, there's no signal there basically to um, to optimize against like time of use, location of use um, uh, and, and, and price of use. So uh, it, it, without that value signal, there is um, there is without that value signal there is um there's no point in doing lots of smart algorithmic stuff it needs the value signal and and this is an example i just wanted to talk about um that we've done we've launched recently so um what we've done is we're working with um a home builder called ilka homes to de develop a thing called zero bills homes and what that is is we um they will build homes to a standard that have uh heat pumps solar battery um ev charger uh, and that standard um, of hardware plus our smart algorithmic control from the intelligent octopus um, will allow us to guarantee zero bills for five years. Um, and, and that zero bills, we can then put on things like right move when people go to buy the house, they can say, oh, this is a zero bills home. Um, so that means I'm gonna basically save two to 3,000 pounds a year uh, on my energy bills so they can put a value on it. And, and I think the reason for me, this is completely revolutionary is that for years as an industry, we've tried to figure out how to get home builders to build um, low carbon energy efficient homes. And the only, uh, and, and we've tried to mandate it, we've tried to sort of encourage it. And yes, some home builders are, are moving in the right direction, but generally we're still getting lots of homes with gas boilers um, being built. What, what this does is it is for the first time, I think it ties together the incentive signal for the home builder and the homeowner. So in the past, if you're a home builder, you'd say, why would I spend an extra 20,000 pounds on kit that I don't need to put in if I could sell the house for the same price at, at the back end um, without that kit? Well, what this now says is, here's an incentive signal for the consumer to go and buy this home for a higher price because they know they, they, they're they going to have zero bills and a low carbon lifestyle. And so, uh, that's innovation through value signal. And, and that is really, really, for me, the most crucial thing as an industry we need to keep in mind is that if we if we erode value signals, socialize all our costs, we will end up uh, not creating the opportunities for smart products and, and data-driven um, products. And then the final thing um, that I, sort of lesson I wanted to share was um, that we need to be, be brave and try stuff. And I wanted to give a shout out to um, a flexibility trial that that National Grid have been pioneering um, for this winter. Um, for those who haven't seen this, what, what National Grid are doing is they're offering um, to pay customers directly or through their suppliers um, for turn down during um, certain events this winter. So when the system has low, has is tight on capacity, they will issue uh, a signal and then suppliers can pass that signal out to their customers, they turn down and they get paid. And that really is this incredible win-win because in the past, 
the na national grid's only option was to pay big generators, um, interconnectors, uh, or maybe some some big demand to to turn down. Um, and that would come at the cost of the consumer who picks up that bill through the balancing system cost. Now what we have is a world where actually customers can get paid sort of a virtuous cycle. And uh, this has come about through trials that we've done with National Grid um, and also bravery from National Grid to go out and, tr and try this. You know, it, we don't it, we, we think it will work. Um, but you don't know until you try. And also you can't iron out all of the operational details until you try these things. So as an industry, I'd say uh, in terms of how you apply, like take take data and turn it into great stuff, you, you first you've got to create product, but you've also got to be brave and put stuff out there. Uh, and that was everything I had to, to say. So um, I'm open for questions. Brilliant, thank you very much, David. That was brilliant. I've, I've actually loads of questions, but there's quite a few in the chat actually already. But I'll, I'll maybe, uh, just mention a, a couple of things. So first, it's, it's interesting. We try and understand a bit more about value, um, you know, in energy. It's very hard to measure, but maybe pizza is the is the way to do that now. Maybe we need to sign amount of pizza to value. But um, I have a quick question about sort of like you grown your team. So I think that's really interesting. Something we're really keen on in the catapult is about how people develop their teams and keep the skills there. So it seems a lot of companies sort of struggle to you know, recruit, there's a bit of a skills gap, but it sounds Octopus are, are doing okay. So it'd be interesting to understand why your thoughts are why Octopus is doing quite well in that area. Um, but also, I guess, another question that is upskilling, how do you sort of maintain within a team, you know, that um, sort of make sure they, you know, are knowing the methods they need and the new tools perhaps, which could help the business? Sure, so um, on the recruiting front, um, uh, I think we're, you know, we're we're helped by being um, a quite a big visible brand, and we're doing lots of great work, and we're in the press a lot, and Greg's very visible. Um, so, so I think we have maybe a slightly advantage position in that sense. So I'm not going to say, you know, everyone else is. Uh, if people are struggling, it's it, it, it's um, because they're not doing what we're doing. But um, I think the key for me is, uh, and I was, um, uh, the the key really is is to. Well, so first, I think we're in a, we're in a very advantaged position as a sector because generally engineers and data people are looking for impact jobs where they can work on interesting problems. And there are no there's no sector which is more impactful and more and has more interesting problems right now. I don't think than, than the energy sector. So we should be able to attract great talent. Um, but I, I think there's obviously like a a, a a wage a price thing, like how much can we pay and um, it, it is sometimes difficult to compete with some of the fintech sectors and uh, and some of the big tech giants. Um, but equally, the I think the thing that 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 keeps that, that attracts and retains great engineering talent and great data talent is being able to work with great tools in, in a way that you're not hampered by a whole bunch of process and uh, and problems. So if you get a bunch of data, great data scientists, you put them in a team, you say. Uh, build something, but you can only use this limited set of tools. And um, and by the way, you have to go through all these stage gates and reporting processes. Um, then they're going to go, well, actually, this is not as fun as I thought it was going to be. Or come into this great organization, but actually, we're going to buy a tool from a, a big third party tech vendor. Uh, and you, all you're going to do is integrate it. That's no fun. So I think keep interesting problems and, um, and a nice working style is uh, is key. Brilliant. Yeah, and I think I, you're right about the, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, so I, I didn't answer your question about training and upskilling. That's a really, that's a, that's a real challenge. Um, we don't have too much structured. I, I see it as like maybe two phases. So um, there's that like entry level. Can, can you get the core technical skills to be able to do data stuff? So can you learn like a scripting language like Python and R? Can you learn SQL? Can you understand databases? For that, there's so much great commodity stuff on the internet. We use a tool called Data Camp, which is very powerful for that. Um, it gets people up that learning, that first learning curve. Then there's the layer of like, can you uh, understand our tools and our domain and our things? And you have to build internal training for that. And so we run a mix of um, some formalist training, but also, you know, we have Slack channels and people can ask questions and people pair with people. So a lot of that is organic. Um, and then, uh, and then there's, I guess, like. Um, uh, there's then like personal development on top of that. So what what like key skills you want to learn? Again, a lot of that could be provided from outside um, parties. Brilliant, thank you. 
Um, quick question from Robbie uh, Morrison, an advocate of he's an advocate of open source energy system modeling, and he receives inquiries from um, commercial energy providers regarding the selection and use of such software. Does Octopus use open source um, and have internal policy in this context, uh, including on contributing back? Uh, yes, we do use open source. Kraken is built on top of Django, which is a um, open source Python web framework. Um, uh, and so yeah, we're not adverse to using open source. I think um, I think most organisations, regardless of how nationally critically secure you are right now, are probably using open source in some context. There are models you can use, like supported open source or sort of managed open source, so where you benefit from the open source technology, but you also benefit from someone making sure it's maintained. You know, if you're running critical infrastructure, um, in terms of giving back. Um, we try and open source. We have a library called uh, Tentaclia, which was built by one of our engineers, which is for connecting to a bunch of different data sources. We've open sourced that, so we try and give back by open sourcing stuff. And also, we will go and contribute at things like DjangoCon. Um, so yeah, we're definitely keen on open source. Great. Nigel Morris asks about the um, the electric bill incentive. Um, if the house is obviously very expensive, then you know that's maybe just a, a lifestyle feel good decision. Is there a sort of decision on where you know connecting out to the property itself and the size? I guess. Yes. Um, so, uh, so it, this is Nigel's question here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, f firstly, I think the average home in the UK is something like 250k, not 900k. Um, so, yes, obviously, the more expensive the home, the less likely you are to care about the size. But equally, a 900k home would probably have a, a larger bill. And once you add a heat pump, etc., in there, um, you know, we see three to four times demand for a heat pump. And PV customer than a typical customer. So energy bills, your electricity bill will go up uh, as you electrify. But we, what we're saying is we can bring it right back down to zero if you have the right kit in your in your home. Ultimately, that that trade off view is a um, it, it, it's up to you. But I think what what I've heard anecdotally is that in both in the rental sector particularly, people are, uh, are really worrying about like how much of my energy bill is going to be. Something a question you probably wouldn't ask on a viewing typically, but now energy prices have risen so much, you might say, "Hang on, what's the energy bill for this home?" So, you know, I think like three four k a year is certainly meaningful. I mean, what what's your mortgage payment on a on a nine hundred k home? It's probably if you if you take three four k off that, it's quite meaningful. Thank you. Uh, Sam Young asks about Intelligent Octopus. Is it just focused on EV or does it cover other techs like batteries and, and PV? Yeah, so right now uh, in the UK, it's EV focused. Um, in the US, we're doing um, uh, cooling, domestic cooling, um, so uh, air conditioners. Uh, I think we have prototypes on um, home batteries. Uh, we started with EVs because they are the most pervasive and uh, easily controllable load. But yeah, what the idea is um, it will be an umbrella. It will be an umbrella UI for all of those smart home appliances. Thanks very much. There's quite a few questions, so I'm just going to. Uh, yeah, keep firing them away. We'll keep firing away. Uh, Damien Kelly asks about considering the off-gem data best practice principles and the recent call they had for input. Um, what do you see as the key principles the supplier market needs to focus on uh, and go deeper uh, in relation to standardization, interoperability? Etc. Gosh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, so it's the supplier's part that has to play within sort of the, you know, I guess there's the focus has been on the networks, but, you know, what part does the supplier really have to play in that? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, right now, the supplier is um, uh, the the sort of point at which the consumer interfaces with the energy system. So uh, the more uh, data driven and digitally savvy the supplier can be, um, the better. I think, um, you know, in terms of like best practice principles, um, yeah, I'm not I'm not overly familiar with the off gen ones. I think a lot of it was about like um, sharing of data, documenting of data, uh, which which and 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 opening up data. I think that probably more holds at a if you're a system if you're if you're effectively a, a system operator or a um, uh, or off gem themselves um, a regulated entity uh, as opposed to a supplier whose job is actually to keep safe a customer's data on their behalf. Well, there's definitely a there's definitely an open banking um, 
type uh, approach that could be taken in the energy sector that allows better sharing of data between the entities. Um, particularly, I think the smart the way, way smart meter data is stored and shared is being looked at by Ofgem because I think that that could open up a whole bunch of different things. I, I probably haven't answered that question perfectly. I'm happy to pick up with Damien separately if he wants to talk follow on. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, Will asks about uh, zero build being a really positive step. So a couple of questions there. How does Octopus make something like that profitable, I guess? And then second is, you know, how do you focus that in on those, you know, who need it the most? People like who are in fuel poverty, for instance. Um, yeah, so uh, we we make money in the same way as we make money on um, a normal energy product. It's just that you have two legs. So you have an import leg and an export leg. Um, and so uh, it's zero bill, not because we're not um, they're, they're having zero import. They have a they have a net import and a net export, um, and, and we can make the economics work between those. So you effectively, the solar plus the battery can export can generate and export electricity um, at at like peak time in the in, in the evening, and so you can make a fair bit of money doing that. And then obviously we pay for the import on behalf of the customer and the way and through our sort of modeling and our intelligence we can we can make that balance um so yeah uh and then how does it uh, we're, we're working with a lot of social housing um developers to make it uh so, so so that a lot of home building is for social housing um which is for low income uh households and um and we're working with a lot of them so hopefully we this should be something which is for for everybody and not just people building um big houses is, is, I guess that's just focused on the new builds. Then there's no there's no thoughts maybe on the retrofitted, retrofitting other houses, older houses. That's my my own sort of add on. Right now it's yeah. Right now it's new build. But watch this space. Okay, great. Um, a question from Yuya is uh, so how is the DS team implementing continuous training, uh, in regard to this sort of NLP um, customer email labeling case using open source software or um, on on build tools or paid services. Um, quite haphazardly, I, I'll be honest with you right now. So um, what I meant by that self-training is that um, we are using the agents as they're looking at messages and looking at the tags to correct the tags. Um, and then we can put that back through a training process. We haven't automated that. So it would be the same um, training algorithm for the model as, as you would have um, when you train the model originally on labeled data. But the thing is, you're generating far more labeled data on the fly and also correcting your labels on the fly. So effectively, it's um, perhaps I was being generous by calling it continuous training. Maybe it's we call it continuous label generation it is what we're doing there. And still okay. all open source. Uh, Alice asks, how do you, uh, how do we accelerate collaboration across the owners of energy data, um, people, people building new propositions and tools? Um, yeah, very good question. I think we're we're we're, uh, we're we're okay in the energy sector. We're doing quite a good job at sharing some data. So particularly people like Alexon, National Grid, do a pretty good job of sharing a lot of their market data. Um, I'd actually say a lot of the data that's that's available and shareable um, is is probably being sh shared right now. Then there's this pocket of data which is not available, where it isn't captured. So things like network topology that I talked about is just um, and maybe like where are the assets, where are the domestic assets within our um, within the networks? They're just not known, so they can't be shared. And that that work at the bottom of the data maturity curve needs to get done to be able to um, to share that to be, before we can. We need to generate the data before we can share it. Um, potentially, uh, I think we we do a relatively good job of um, you know when people come to us and say. Um, can we use some smart data for smart meter data for to look at some study? You know, if we think we've worked with a few universities to, to on, on projects like that, obviously we need to do it with the consent of the customer or in a GDPR anonymized way. So that's um, careful. I think I think the like the permissioning and data sharing model for smart meter data is probably the thing that unlocks this the most. I know it's something that Ofgem is starting to think about and look at. So I would say that's the key. Thank you. David asks, um, how do you manage other elements over and above demand, such as frequency when the grid is split up? I guess talking maybe about the sort of areas of the network. Do you use core stable energy supplies, CCGT with carbon capture or batteries or use storage such as spin wheels on the grid? Why wheels maybe? Uh, so, I so I think oh, we're, um, 
from a flex from a grid scale flexibility perspective, we're big backers of domestic flexibility, which is where you either use EVs, assets, or just customer behavior to um, to, to provide flexibility. We think that's a massive untapped resource uh, and it's going to even get bigger. Um, in terms of grid scale flexibility, um, our Crack and Flex team manage, uh, often on behalf of other owners, or provide the platform to manage um, uh, lots of different types of technologies, but mainly um, grid scale batteries. Uh, Liang asks about, uh, could you talk a bit more about the flexibility trial and national grid? Um, what are some of the key findings and challenges? I guess it's it's not run yet, but I, um, you know, will you be sharing those? I guess why more widely since it's a sort of yeah, yeah. So, so national grid will be, um, I think, public publishing. Uh, I don't want to make promises on their behalf, but it's a it's not just us and them. We pioneered it with them with a trial study called CrowdFlex. I think there's a report published on CrowdFlex. Um, so um, just Google National Grid CrowdFlex. That was that was an early stage trial where we where we went out to homes and said, um, can you turn down? It was very successful, um, I think. Uh, and so that, then this is this is off the back of that, but many suppliers can take part in this. I think like the key um, challenges for this are finding the right incentive signal for the customer. So is it like a one? Is it like a subscription type model? Is it do you pay them? in a pence per kilowatt hour basis, what really gets the customer excited um, and what's the right UI for the customer? So do they, um, are they, are they actually motivated by like uh, green savings and CO2 savings or are they motivated by purely by the pounds? And then what's the right, like how do we automate the, the like customer out of this in a way is the other thing, like how do we do this? So it's like, you know, cu customers don't have to go to their dishwasher and turn it off at the right time. We can automate some of that. So there's, I, I, I think there's going to be a fascinating number of findings. Um, it, equally, just like the scale of it, like how much, how many power stations can we not turn up uh, in a, 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 um, at times of um, system stress? How frequently, frequently do you think something this like this could be run really as well, while still being effective? Uh, yeah, that's another very good question. So, like, how how sticky is this as a product? How many customers do customers continue to take part? We're going to find that out. I think um, I can't remember what exactly National Grid are planning to do in terms of number, but there will be um, not one but many uh, events done over this over this winter across quite a lot of customers. So, I think I think we'll find that out. What we've seen in California is that when people are asked to turn down because the system stress, they do a really wonderful job of doing it. They can they can shed demand very very fast if they know that they are, they are that they're helping the system. So, um, yeah, there's but def, there's definitely a sort of boy who cried wolf type problem in here. If you know if, if you're doing it, if you're doing it every day, is that the right product for it, or is that a different domestic flexibility product that doesn't that isn't sort of as pushy on the app? Perhaps yeah. So pizza could be offered or something like a incentivize or some other incentives. Uh, Jess, Jessica asks, um, a lot of the products you presented about were aimed at domestic customers. So what are you doing with uh, sort of business customers uh, who will be also struggling um, with the bills? If this isn't a focus area, what are the key challenges preventing uh, the work with, with um, businesses? Yeah, so we have a great business team um, and, and a business book of customers. Um, we uh, have a much bigger book of domestic customers and I focus more on that area. So I've talked more about those use cases. Um, uh, I, I think in terms, I think we're probably doing less on affordability in the business space. Um, again, probably because of like resource and numbers, um, but we recognize that a lot of businesses are struggling. And I think, you know, where the rubber hits the road in terms of how we help those is um, being, uh, clever and considerate in the way we do things like debt relief and um, uh, and repayment planning. Um, in terms of like innovative products for businesses, I, we're looking at, um, uh, I think like th things like matching matching businesses to local generation is a, is a, is a, is a push. So for allowing businesses to effectively optimize their supply more is something that we're working on. Great, uh, there's just a couple of more comments. Um, so, it's important to remember that the consumer owns their own energy data and they're the ones who decide to share it. I guess, um, you know, this is very much about sort of, you know, how how the relationship works really and sort of, um, you know, how do you sort of balance that between sort of giving them good services and also, you know, maintaining this sort of ownership of that data and, and their, their privacies and other things. Yeah, so, so, so the way it works is like, these products, these smart products we're providing require use of your smart meter data. So that's that's the that's the quid pro quo. 
in many ways that's that's nicer than maybe uh the way some data driven products work like you know, things like google where you know if you're not paying you're the product is the is the sort of phrase there um so yeah but we obviously get opt-in for customers so we say would you like this product in order to have this product in terms of how data is shared between parties uh, getting this right is really really important and i think open banking did a pretty good job of it um and the way it works so banking is the the bank you're banking with is your you, you own your data the bank you're banking with is the steward of that of that data on your behalf and then you can authenticate that bank to share data in an easy way so you don't have to gra drag your data down and then share it back around to other banks you can allow sharing in a standardized format but ultimately you you decide you set the permissions those permissions are easily accessible and easily changeable and that is a really great model that empowers data sharing to enable new business models but also data like ownership so the last thing we want is to is a model where like you know um a whole bunch of sales agencies can just rip down all of your smart meter data and do some like quite nefarious things with it because we have this sort of like unprotected data sharing model hey brilliant uh, just a few more questions and we'll, we'll probably wrap up uh sam uh, asks uh, about the sort of that interesting thing you had where you could donate some of the savings to the hardship fund so um you know do you can you automatically identify those people who might be struggling and therefore could utilize that fund or is it sort of more of a uh, you know waiting to be contacted right. yeah so um I, I actually the government do a uh, and and um the energy sector a wider energy sector do a pretty good job of helping to target uh regardless of whether it's um the, the discretionary fund or whether it's things like warm home discount um they use uh, the benefit system and they help us find the right people initially to to provide um help to we then obviously have a lot of people who come to us who aren't part of that umbrella because people's affordability is changing fast uh, and in the wrong direction so um where people aren't part of that umbrella uh um they can come to us and find and um and ask us and we help we go through a set of forms to, to understand their like affordability criteria um when we, we also ha we can model and we have done modeling on like can we predict things like warm home discount eligibility from um uh from some features we have about home and demographics um but generally we we, we get enough of a steer from the Department of Work and Pensions and also from inbound to really know. But we also the key is also to make it very clear in our communications, which we do, that there, there is this. Um, this is how you get help if you need help so people can come to us. Thank you. Uh, this will be the last question because you've had quite a few. We're, in, we're nearly hitting the 1 p.m. mark. But uh, Barsanti asks, uh, says very interesting talk. Do you think that automation of these services will remain the key aspect in the future? Or will it be possible to engage consumers more actively? in the direction of behavioral demand response between automation um, i guess and then or just sort of directly in de engaging consumers yeah i i think um i th i think there's a sort of there are markets for both cases so there will always be some customers who like to take a price signal and have the control themselves or take a price signal and plug it into their own like a third party um tool uh, and equally there are customers who want just the peace of mind of knowing that someone's taking care of it for them um and maybe the way to think about this is like the mobile market where some people like to buy a data package and they just know that it's handled for them they know they're paying a monthly bill and some people like to do pay as you go um and they can sort of optimize it it's not a perfect analogy but like the same in the mortgage space some people like to fix and some people like to sit on the variable so um my i think if you look at those two sectors you probably would say that the majority of people would like a sort of automated managed service with a, with a minority wanting uh, price signals. But, you know, that's what we can't, I can't tell you the answer to that. That's what like market discovery is. That's product, what product market fit finding is. We go out there, we launch products and we see what um, customers like and then we iterate on them. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess we'll wrap it up there. That was really interesting. You've got a lot of, uh, questions you know clearly everyone's really engaged with the talk uh we're going to be sharing this um the the recording will be on our, our youtube page after this um and we'll share um we'll share the slides as well um but yeah if there's any other questions i guess you're you're welcome to take further further debate and questions if you're um after this with uh with david but yeah i just want to say a big thank you very much for a really interesting talk
um yeah and i'm looking forward to seeing how the trial goes brilliant yeah me too thank you very much Stephen, and thanks for having me thank you yeah and i'll contact you after the talk anyway so brilliant email so brilliant yeah thank you very much david wonderful thanks everyone cheers bye, -bye.